Hello and welcome to Runkle and the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I wasn't planning on doing a video today, but there was just a statement released that I think I need to address because this is a big deal, not just for Canadians, but also for Americans, people in the UK, people all over the world, really. This is a big deal. This is potentially a giant problem. Now, this is the international statement on end-to-end -end encryption and public safety. I'll start off by noting that I'm not a technical expert. I am lucky enough to have some technical experts who I've been able to talk to and gain some understanding of this, but it's sort of a well-read layperson's understanding. I'm sure there's far more technically adept people here, but I still think I can sort of explain some of the issues I've got with this and some of the issues I think you should have with this. And so let's dive in and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So here we see international statement. We, the undersigned, support strong encryption, which plays a crucial role in protecting personal data, privacy, intellectual property, trade secrets, and cybersecurity. Already, we're talking about half-truths here, because it does play a crucial role in protecting all the things they note, but they do not support strong encryption. We'll see a little bit more what I'm talking about here. It also serves a vital purpose in repressive states to protect journalists, human rights defenders, and other vulnerable people, as stated in the 2017 resolution of the UN Human Rights Council. Encryption is an existential anchor of trust in the digital world, and we do not support counterproductive and dangerous approaches that would materially weaken or limit security systems. So right now we can already tell they're making an attack on encryption here. And when they talk about the importance of encryption, uh, they're probably underselling it here. Everything that you do online is, you know, not, well, almost everything you do online relies on encryption. When you buy something, encryption is needed to make sure that transaction is secure. If you log into a web page, you're using encryption to make sure that happens. When you submit tax information, same thing. If you're working from home in the COVID era, then the reason why your employer is going to be okay with that if you're dealing with anything remotely sensitive, which just about all business data is, is because you're using almost certainly an encrypted connection to your workplace so that the data that is sent from your computer to your employer and from your employer back to you is secure along the way that no one else can listen into it. When they say that they don't support counterproductive and dangerous approaches that would materially weaken or limit security systems, the problem is, is that they can't get any of the things they want without counterproductive or dangerous approaches. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But they note, particular implementations of encryption technology, however, pose significant challenges to public safety, including to highly vulnerable members of our societies like sexually exploited children. We urge industry to address our serious concerns where encryption is applied in a way that wholly precludes any legal access to content. We call on technology companies to work with governments to take the following steps focused on reasonable, technically feasible solutions. They say, embed the safety of the public in system designs, thereby enabling companies to act against illegal content and activity effectively with no reduction to safety and facilitating the investigation and prosecution of offenses and safeguarding the vulnerable. To translate that, they want companies to be able to listen in on your communications and they want law enforcement to be able to listen in on your communications. So they want to break encryption in ways that make that possible. Next, enable law enforcement access to content in a readable and usable format where an authorization is lawfully issued, is necessary and proportionate, and is subject to strong safeguards and oversight, and engage in consultation with governments and other stakeholders to facilitate legal access in a way that is substantive and genuinely influences design decisions. So. When they talk about protecting people from repressive states, including journalists, human rights defenders, and other vulnerable people, they're talking about protecting them from governments. You know, they're not talking about protecting them from the guy down the street or from criminals. They're talking, this is talking about protecting from the government. And yet at the same time, they're also talking about weakening or eliminating the protections people have from a government. You can't have it both ways on this. Either you're going to protect people from repressive states or you're going to allow governments access to this stuff. But you got to pick. I'm sorry. 
And they are picking here. What they're picking is that they don't actually care about the journalists, human rights defenders, and other vulnerable people. They want access. Now, the problem with encryption is that typically there's going to be a lot of metaphors used in terms of what encryption is. People will talk about, you know, a magic box or, you know, locks of various sorts. But encryption isn't any of these things. Encryption codes the material. It scrambles it such that you can't unpack it without a key that is essentially a bit of information that tells you how it was scrambled so that you can know how to unscramble it. So that's basically what we're talking about here. But they're saying we need to be able to listen to that. And there's one of two ways they can do that. One, they can leak your key. Actually, three ways here that I can think of. And again, the tech experts can probably provide more. But one, they can leak your key so that your key is now available to other people and they can gain access to that. Or two, they can send your data in non-encrypted format to or you know, some different form of encryption to where it's unpacked and viewable in plain text in sort of ordinary, sort of as you would view it at the, you know, a central hub and then sent on its way. Or three, they can make it so that everything that's encrypted is also encrypted with another secret key that then they can use to decrypt it themselves. So there's two means of, un, you know, of decrypting it. Problem with all of this is that all of these things break the encryption in ways that make it not secure and not suitable for the purposes for which we use encryption. So moving on a little bit to talk a little bit more about what they're talking about here. Impact on public safety. Law enforcement has a responsibility to protect citizens by investigating and prosecuting crime and safeguarding the vulnerable. Technology companies also have responsibilities and put in place terms of service for their users that provide them authority to act to protect the public. End-to-end -end encryption that precludes lawful access to the content of communications in any circumstances directly impacts these responsibilities, creating severe risks to public safety in two ways. First, by severely undermining a company's own ability to identify and respond to violations of their terms of service. This includes responding to the most serious illegal content and activity on its platform, including child sexual exploitation and abuse, violent crime, terrorist propaganda and attack planning, and by precluding the ability of law enforcement agencies to access content in limited circumstances where necessary and proportionate to investigate serious crimes and protect national security where there's lawful authority to do so. So here they're trotting out the usual boogeymen. Whenever the government says we want to limit rights, they always go to the big scary things that everybody hates. Child sexual exploitation and abuse, terrorism, drugs. They're not as big on mentioning these days because public sentiment on that is turned away from them. But whenever the government starts talking about these big scary things, we should be a little skeptical because this is how they start essentially claiming that they need to come after rights protections. You know, they say we need to be able to search people's houses because of these scary things. We need to be able to, uh, you know, this is how they get people to turn off their natural sort of skepticism of, you know, government powers. So it's really, you know, it's really frustrating and if you go back in time, right now the Liberal government is, you know, they're a signatory on this. Bill Blair is one of the people who signed this on behalf of the Canadian government. But previously, if you go back a little bit, uh, the positions were reversed. The Liberal Party of Canada was saying, you know, we want to oppose this stuff. Uh, in particular, when uh, Vic Taves was saying, you know, you're either with us or you're with the child pornographers. Same kind of language. It's just, you know, I want to scare you by referring to the big scary people. Anyway, going back to it. Uh, Concern about these risks has been brought into sharp focus by proposals to apply end-to-end -end encryption across major messaging services. UNICEF estimates that one in three internet users is a child. The We Protect Global Alliance, a coalition of 98 countries, 39 of the largest companies in the global technology industry, and 41 leading civil society organizations, set out clearly the severity of the risks, and they're going to go on here and, again, more scare tactics about kids. 
The thing to remember here is that there is always a way to get around this encryption, which is that you look at it at the end point. Somebody has access to this. It's just harder for the police and the police don't want, you know, to they don't want their life to be more difficult. They want to be able to break all of this encryption. So that's sort of the uh, the concern there. But they're saying if end to end encryption is implemented without a solution in place to safeguard children, NCM's EC estimates that more than half of its cyber tip line reports will vanish. Again, they're trying to sort of scare us on these points. So response, in light of these threats, there is increasing consensus across governments and international institutions that action must be taken. While encryption is vital and privacy and cybersecurity must be protected, that should not come at the expense of wholly precluding law enforcement and the tech industry itself from being able to act against the most serious illegal content and activity online. And so they're saying, you know, the governments of the United Kingdom, United States, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada issued a communique concluding that tech companies should include mechanisms in the design of their encrypted products and services whereby governments acting with appropriate legal authority can gain access to data in a readable and usable format. These companies should also embed the safety of their users in their system designs, enabling them to take action against illegal content, which means they want the companies monitoring every communication that is sent out. On uh, the October 8th, 2019, think about that in terms of Canada Post. Do you really want Canada Post opening every letter? That's what they're talking about in terms of, you know, companies monitoring all of this content. It's so... The Council of the EU adopted its conclusions on combating child sexual abuse, stating the Council urges the industry to ensure lawful access for law enforcement and other competent authorities to digital evidence, including when encrypted or hosted on IT servers located abroad, without prohibiting or weakening encryption and in full respect of privacy and fair trial guarantees consistent with applicable law. Problem is, is that you can't do it without weakening encryption because encryption on itself provides a effectively a full bar to this so when they say without weakening encryption or prohibiting encryption this is impossible it's also a bit of a pipe dream here that they're talking about this notion that we can prevent this i'll go through the conclusion because we're almost through the statement itself and then i'll talk a little bit more about why it's a pipe dream so conclusion, we are committed to working with industry to develop reasonable proposals that will allow technology companies and governments to protect the public and their privacy, defend cybersecurity and human rights, and support technological innovation. While this statement focuses on the challenges posed by end-to-end -end encryption, that commitment applies across the range of encrypted services available, including device encryption, so they mean your home computer, custom encrypted applications, and encrypted across integrated platforms. We reiterate that data protection, respect for privacy, and the importance of encryption as, a, as technology changes and global internet standards are developed remain at the forefront of each state's legal framework. We, have, we challenge the assertion that public safety cannot be protected without compromising privacy or cybersecurity. We strongly believe that approaches protecting each of these important values are possible and strive to work with industry to collaborate on mutually agreeable solutions. Unfortunately, the mathematicians who develop encryption and who are the people who know about encryption disagree strongly with this point. They disagree that these things are possible. Now, encryption works. It, it's fundamental. What makes it function is math. It is based on mathematical principles. And what that means is that you can't really prevent people from having access to encryption because math is not a thing that you can make disappear. Math is, to be sort of glib about it, it is the rules on which the universe functions. So math is accessible. I mean, they're not going to be able to stop teaching mathematics. And of course, once you teach people how to make encrypted products, that, you know, they can make those things regardless of whether or not it's following these guidelines. What that means is that when they start talking about, you know, terrorists and, you know, child exploiters and all of these bad, scary people, they're still going to have access to good encryption because it's actually easier to make in a lot of cases, you know, than building some complicated backdoor. Now, 
it's even easier to make just terrible encryption that doesn't protect anybody. But building these sort of back doors that they're talking about is a step harder. So it's not going to provide any actual real security. It's going to undermine, you know, the sort of ordinary user without helping the main issues that they're talking about here. Products that provide good encryption are already out there. They're not going to go away. They're still going to be accessible. It's really hard to see how this makes a whole lot of sense here. All this is, is it's dangerous. This is what we can look at as sort of a an opening salvo. They're calling on tech companies to do these things. But we have to recognize that this sort of call is going to be backed up in future by legislative approaches. And that's a problem. But again, really what they're trying to do is they're trying to restrict math. The other thing to remember is that it's really impossible to build this sort of backdoor in a way that doesn't endanger the public. Remember how ever, I mentioned that encryption is encoding things. It's, you know, what that means is that not only, it's not something like a physical key where if the keys go missing, you can change your locks and protect yourself because somebody can record your data today and hope that, you know, one year later, five years later, 10 years later, that the key gets leaked. And that at that point, they can decrypt all of that stuff that they've been saving. All of your privacy for those past 10 years is obliterated in a second once one of these keys leak, assuming somebody has been interested in you in some fashion. And keep in mind that once these keys are built in, they become incredibly valuable for bad actors of various sorts. You know, if you can start gaining access to somebody's banking information for the past however long, you could do an incredible amount of damage. There is no way when we're talking about essentially just barring a bit of information to ensure that it doesn't get leaked. Eventually, somebody is going to copy one of these things. Uh, somebody is going to lose one to, you know, some malicious actor. Uh, organized crime is going to be interested in this. Foreign governments are going to be interested in this. Even just anybody who's a troublemaker will be interested in this. And once they solve one of these, you know, things, the impact is tremendous. So this is really concerning. This is an attack on the fundamental bases of how our life in the digital age works. And I just also want to look at the uh, the signatories on this. So we've got uh, Priti Patel, uh, who's an MP from the United Kingdom and Secretary of State from the Home Department. I'm going to jump to the end here because I mostly have a Canadian audience. Uh, we see Bill Blair, Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Public Safety Canada, famously known for, uh, you know, the G20 protests and the suppression that uh, took place there, although he takes no responsibility for that. Uh, we've got uh, Peter Dutton, MP from Australia, uh, Andrew Little, Minister of Justice from uh, New Zealand. We've got India and Japan, who nobody in particular has signed on to it other than just India and Japan. But if you're thinking, you know, hey, I like Trump better than Trudeau, William P. Barr, who's Trump's right-hand man, is signed on to this. This is not really a left or right thing. This is a government versus individuals. And really, this is ultimately a people who understand math and information security issues versus people who don't. Because the governments who are pushing this fundamentally don't get the issue. Uh, it was quite famously noted that... Uh, you know, the law or the laws of math are subordinate to the laws of, I think that was New Zealand, where they said the laws of math uh, must obey the laws of, again, I think it was New Zealand, but I'm not 100% uh, certain on that. But you can't beat math. Math is ultimately going to win the day. So this is very frustrating. I'm very unhappy to see this sort of push here. And I'm hoping that if you see this, you'll get in touch with your, you know, with your MPs, with whatever politicians are in your area. Tell them that you don't agree with this. Tell them that you don't appreciate this sort of step. And hopefully we can back them away from what I anticipate is 
Otherwise, the inevitable legislative proposals where they start trying to ban things. That's really where I'm concerned here and really where I think you should be concerned. At any rate, I, I hope you, you found this, I was going to say interesting and educational, but I kind of hope that this is you found this a little scary because it should be. This is something we should be worried about. And as much as I've said, hey, we should be concerned when governments are you know trying to scare us here, it's a little more reasonable to be scared of your government when they're trying to exercise this sort of power. But uh, please like, share, and subscribe if you've uh, found this interesting or important. I'm hoping that this one gets shared widely because it's a really important message. This is a really big issue. And I, yeah, I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $10 level, my buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, Mark D, General Counsel of the CCFR, John Robinson, Tim Rogers, Roy Haddock, Frackles Dak, Jean-Alexandre Tessier, Cameron Johnson, Sir Goat, Sites and Arms Limited, Chaba Hollow, Peter Heinem, Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, Toys Are For Boys, Ian Vaughn, Milan Vrekic, Terence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Malcolm Taylor, Brad Crooker, Jason Harrington, Lee Kiso, Mark Stout, Scott Sweetman, Mike Rhodes, Alvaro Batele, I'm probably mispronouncing that, I'm sorry, uh, and at the $30 uh, level, a special thank you to Steve Browning. I'm going to leave a link in the, you know, the description here to this statement so that you can read it yourself. Once again, thank you for watching and I hope I've armed you with knowledge.